All right. Welcome everybody to the HyperWorks 2021 Next Generation Interface webinar. My name is Blake Sanfilippo. I'm an application engineer with Altair. And I'm going to be walking you guys through our next generation of HyperWorks. And my goal here is to show you guys the features that we've brought into HyperWorks. Some features are very simple and small, but they're going to make a huge difference in your daily use of our tools and setting up your models for analysis. I'm also going to be showing you guys some really big features, some really new cap big capabilities that we've brought in, into the HyperWorks interface that are really going to push the limits on the problem solving that you guys are able to do right directly in our tools. So let's first take a look at HyperWorks. Uh, if you guys have been using HyperWorks since the beginning, you may recognize this. This interface actually predates my time with Altair. But we're going to look through and see how the HyperWorks interface has changed and evolved over the years. We're going to see here the interface is changing. They're adding more features. And finally, we're going to settle on what's going to be actually our next generation of that HyperWorks interface. So this interface is both a lot easier on the eyes, but again, there's a lot of features built into this interface that are going to make uh, your daily pre-processing and analysis setup a lot more intuitive, a lot easier to use, and just downright faster to get from point A to point B. So the question is, how am I going to transition to this new interface? Well, I really want to point out that all models, scripts, and processes that you've used in the classic interface are going to work the same in our new interface. So it's the same hypermesh file, it's the same database file. So not only will they work interchangeably, but you can actually open up that exact same hypermesh file between the different interfaces uh, seamlessly without any issues. So again, the classic interface is what we see here, and our goals are going to be transition to be to transition onto this new next generation interface. And really, my goal here again is to show you guys those uh, tips and tricks. I'm going to be doing most of this webinar live in the tool. And I'll just be relying on a, on a few slides uh, throughout the process. All right, so maybe the question is, well, why do we have a new interface? Well, again, we want to save you guys time and I like to say headaches throughout your pre-processing uh, work. But really, we also want to have this seamless workflow between our products. So we're actually unifying our interfaces between tools like HyperWorks, SimLab, and Inspire. If you guys have used these various tools, uh, this, these interfaces may be somewhat familiar to you. But again, we're trying to unify these interfaces moving forward so that a user can seamlessly move between our different applications and be able to leverage things like uh, Alter Activate for 1D simulation all the way to uh, HyperWorks for our full 3D model build and uh, analysis. All right, so let's go ahead and transition to HyperWorks. So right off the bat, when we open up the new HyperWorks interface, we're going to see that we have this nice getting started tool. If you click on this, it's going to open up a web-based help. that's going to show you a bunch of videos, some shortcuts and mouse controls, some self-paced training, as well as documentation that's going to really make this an easy transition from the classic interface into our new next generation interface. Uh, but I'm going to be covering a lot of this information here live for you guys as well. Uh, keep in mind, if you guys have questions, feel free to add those to the chat, and we'll have time at the end of this webinar to answer those questions. All right. So one of the biggest differences between the classic interface and the new interface is that we're not really relying on the panels as much as we did in the classic interface. Uh, but, but don't worry, those panels are still here. So in case you guys have your favorite workflow or there's something you're really used to, uh, it's easy to go ahead and open up those panels to use those traditional workflows. So the reason I bring this up is because I want you guys to be very comfortable making this transition into this new tool. I always recommend users to, to open up this tool and just start working because all of the classic tools that you've used before are still going to be available in this new interface. But there's going to be tons of features packed into here that's really going to save you guys time. And as you learn those features, uh, it's really going to be hard, I believe, to go back to that classic interface. Uh, just, again, from a, a user intuitive standpoint, as well as just enjoyment in using these tools. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close out those panels. We'll just operate here directly in the GUI. So our goal with this new interface is really to be GUI driven. We want you guys to be able to work directly on your model to make changes and, and build this model up. 
So one of my favorite parts of, of Hyperworks is the ability that I can just easily drag and drop a file directly in this interface and Hyperworks will load that. So I can drag and drop a HyperMesh model file. I can drag and drop an input deck for a solver, whether it's an Altair solver or a third party solver. I can drag and drop a CAD file and HyperMesh is just going to automatically recognize that file and load the file type needed. Traditionally, you'd have to go in, you have to go to import, you tell Hyper, HyperMesh which file type you want it to bring in and then search your files for that file. Here, we just drag and drop. So this is just a small example of how we've eliminated a bunch of steps in a very you know, simple uh, functionality that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, the next thing you're going to notice that's different in this tool is that my mouse controls have changed. So for classic HyperMesh users, you may remember that you have to hold the control key uh, in conjunction with your mouse to manipulate your model. In the new interface, we've eliminated that. So now, in order to, to pan my model, I'm just going to right-click, pan around, zoom, just middle mouse wheel, and I can middle mouse click to rotate my model. Uh, depending on where my mouse is located, it's going to change the center rotation for my model. And if I'm off of any feature model, it's just going to snap to the center of gravity for that model. Um, next here is uh, a big difference is the selection type in the new interface. So for this selection type, if I want to go in and select a, a feature, all I have to do is hover my mouse over that feature and left click. And it's automatically going to select uh, the entity type that I've um, clicked on. Notice that it switched this to components from that lightning bolt. Uh, I can also go in and when I'm on this all selection, I can select things like loads and Hyperworks is automatically going to update what I'm selecting based on what I've clicked on. I can also click on this drop down and change this to a specific entity type that I'd like to select. So maybe I want to select elements. I can switch that to elements. I can zoom in and box select some elements to select those. I can click I on my keyboard to isolate, or I can also right click and see some um, other controls for selection and visualization controls. But the big feature of this tool that I want to point out is if I look at this list of entities, I can see that there's an underlining for the first letter of these words. That means if I want to go to components, I can click C on my keyboard to automatically view components. If I want to look at elements, I can click E on the keyboard. Solids will be, or sorry, surfaces will click S. If I want to get to solids, I can click S again. So I can very easily manipulate the entity type that I want to select. Even further, let's say I go to components and I select this component, the scooper for um, this assembly here. If I want to select all the elements that are in this component, I can simply have that component selected. I can then click E on my keyboard or go into that element entity type, and it's going to select all the elements that were associated with that component. Let's say I want to find all the nodes that are associated with those elements. I can click N. It's going to find all those nodes. And maybe I want to find any load that's associated with the nodes that I have selected. So if I do that, I can go ahead and click L, and that's going to find all the loads that are associated with those nodes. So we can see with the selection type, it makes it really easy for me to find specific selections uh, and just you know, kind of navigate through uh, a complex assembly. Uh, so that selection type is going to uh, continue throughout all the tools in Hyperworks. So anytime I'm using a tool, maybe I'm doing some geometry manipulation, some meshing, any tool that has a selection type is going to operate the same as a selection tool. I can click these three dots to go to advanced selection, and it's going to give me a plethora of other selection types that I can use to select the entity uh, that, I'm, that I'm dealing with. All right, so now that we've seen that selection type, let's go ahead and look at this um, show hide tool. So I'm going to click on this show hide tool, and we're going to see how we can quickly uh, parse down this, this model to find specific components that I want to deal with. So I'm going to go ahead and just left click on a few components. And I can see that it's hidden those components from my view, but it's also saved those components as a selection in my model. So from here, since I have those selected, I can click R on my keyboard to reverse that selection. Or I can click I on my keyboard 
to isolate uh, or middle mouse click to isolate that selection. And now I've easily gone in and uh, reduced my model down to just the pertinent components that I care about. The next thing I want to show you guys is how I can actually save the view of this component. So I can go back and actually snap to the view. So I have a few saved view here so that's going to show me not only the location in the model but what was visualized. And again I can head back to that view that I had created. So I can easily filter out my model and then save a view to get back to that filter whenever I need. Furthermore, Let's say I want to very quickly save some views. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hide a component here. And I'm going to press Control and 1 on my keyboard, and I can see that I have a saved view using the Control 1 key. I'm just going to continue on here and press Control 2 and hide some more components, Control 3. And now if I want to quickly get back to those saved views, I can click 1 on my keyboard to find that view saved with Control 1, and the same with 2 on my keyboard and 3. And again, I'm going to see those saved views that I have in that model. Uh, so that's a way that I can quickly, again, filter out um, my model to a smaller subsection and easily get back to those. Uh, furthermore, a tool that I really enjoy is this, is this lock unlock view. So if I lock my view, it means that any show hide operations that I perform, maybe I want to, uh, if I press Control A with this model unlocked, or if I press A with this model unlocked, it's going to show all of the components in my model. Perhaps I want to lock this view, and so that any show hide operation I use, so if I go ahead and hide this component, and then I say um, show all, it's only going to show all the components that were uh, visible before I locked my model. So again, if you guys have ever had a complex assembly where you're selecting certain entities, uh, this is a really easy way to lock that model so you don't have to worry about uh, bringing in too much information when you're uh, manipulating your model. All right. Uh, so another cool feature that I like to point out here is let's say I want to organize some elements into a new component. So I have all these separate components here. Maybe I want to make sure that these elements are all in the same component. I'm going to go ahead and, with my components selection active, I'm just going to right click and say create component. I'm going to call this new. I'll say close. And now I'm going to see that I have a component, a new component in my components list. All right, now I can go ahead and switch to elements here. I'm just going to switch to elements, press control A on my keyboard to select all shown elements. I'm going to then go ahead and either um, right click to organize uh, these elements or I can press O on my keyboard. It's going to allow me to organize these into a new component. So I have my element selected. I can just write in this model browser, click on that new component and I can middle mouse click to organize all those elements to uh, a new component there. So again, in the previous tools, we'd go to view, I'll go to my panels here. If I were to do this the same, I'd go to tool, organize, elements, I'd select these elements. I'd then have to go and open up this list of these components to find whichever component I wanted to organize this to and click move. So you can see here that by just a few uh, keyboard clicks, I can very easily select elements I want and organize those into a new bucket. All right, and again, our whole goal here is to be really GUI intensive. So I've just organized these elements into a new component. Let's say I want to assign a property to these elements. Well, traditionally you'd go into the model browser, you'd find which component they're a part of and edit those properties. But if I can just visualize these right, visualize this right in my window, I can just double click on this component and this it's gonna allow me to edit this component. So I'm going to go ahead and assign a property. Let's call this P shell. And now it's going to assign this property to those new elements. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and view the thickness of these elements using my view tool to see the thickness that's assigned to all of these elements. This is just a uh, thickness uh, representation uh, so I can actually visualize the thickness that's being applied to these elements. Let's say that I want to actually go in 
and change the thickness of these elements. So similar to how I could edit the component, if I change this to properties, I can go ahead and double click on a property and edit the thickness of that property directly from the graphics window. So again, these are just a few features and tips that we can use to directly manipulate our models right in the, uh, in the GUI to save a lot of time with a lot of this pre-processing. All right, finally, we can have some more uh, visualization controls. If I change this to my section cuts tool, I can go ahead and add a section cut. It's gonna allow me to manipulate my model and uh, work on my model with a, a section cut directly on that model. So I need to look interior to a model to uh, set up analyses or just pre-process this model. I can easily add a section cut to work throughout that model. All right, so that covers a lot of the basics of our new GUI and manipulation for this model. And we're gonna go ahead and transition on now to uh, a separate model where we're gonna see a lot of the uh, geometry creation and manipulation tools that we can use when pre-processing. All right, so let's load in this next model and take a look at some of these features. So first, before I actually get into some features, I wanna show you guys a couple other things that'll help you transition into the new interface. So let's say I'm using a new tool and I'm not really sure how to best use that tool or even really what that tool is for. Well, for all of our tools, we have a nice little dropdown that's gonna explain information about that tool and some of the mouse controls that we can use to actually use that tool. <clears throat> also, I'm gonna see this little, uh, you know, certain tools have a little video icon that's gonna show me a short animation on that tool being used and some of the ways that you can actually execute that feature. All right, so actually let's go in and use this patch tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and see that I have a few different holes in my surface that I may wanna patch. So if I click this find icon, Hyperworks is gonna find those sections of model that need to be patched and highlight those. Now further, if I have a large or complex assembly, maybe there's a lot of interior surfaces and I can't find those just off the view, if I click on this little arrow key, it's gonna actually uh, select these different patch locations that Hyperworks found and really isolate those so I can, I can uh, directly uh, affect those. All right, so I can say patch all and Hyperworks is gonna patch all of the found holes or when I'm focused on one, I can just left click to confirm that patch. Also, let's say that I want to manually go in and patch these tools. I can simply double click on a single edge and it's going to find that closed loop. I can click that edge and drag it across to link it up with an opposite edge, whether it be a direct opposite or a side edge to patch those as well. Uh, I could also go in and actually select multiple edges to patch if I have a complex patch that I like to run. But let's say we actually have some more complex geometry. In this case, if I just delete that surface right in the tool and I go ahead and click and drag this surface down, we're gonna see that Hyperworks creates that patch surface. However, we know that that was actually a tangential surface between those two surfaces I patched. Well, when I have this surface created, if I just left click again, Hyperworks is just gonna to toggle between those two surfaces. So again, this is another simple feature that can really help out when you're editing uh, or creating geometry. All right, let's get into some uh, more geometry creation like points. So in this case, I can create points and a really huge feature of the new interface is that I can actually snap two geometry features. So you can see that it's snapped this mid plane, an end point. Uh, it's actually gonna to snap to a list of different features in my model. So again, if I wanna create a point, I can just click in space. I can also click at a midpoint or maybe uh, even click and drag to have a point between two locations. If I want to, I can control click three locations along a line to have a circle center created. 
Uh, and that manipulation of selecting that geometry is going to be throughout the entire HyperWorks interface. So if I want to actually split this surface, maybe I want to add a line, I can click and drag and snap to different features. Uh, again, it's going to find those locations. If I do things like if I start dragging a certain direction and I hold shift, it's going to maintain that direction, or that angle from that traditional line. And I can even snap to other features with my while maintaining that direction. So again, there's a lot of really just nice, easy to use built-in features that's going to allow me to quickly pre-process and affect my model. Now in, in HyperWorks, when we mesh a part, the mesh is going to be associated with the surface. <clears throat> so if I mesh a part and I have a bunch of uh, features on this, like these lines, it's going to affect the flow of my mesh. So for example, if I put a mesh on these surfaces, I can see that those lines are going to affect the flow of that mesh. Uh, what's nice in Hyperworks is that if I change that mesh, it's automatically, or change the surface, it's automatically going to update my mesh. So let's go to geometry and let's go ahead to the stitch tool. In this case, I can manually suppress an edge, or if I just click and drag this entire surface, I can one click auto suppress, and Hyperworks is going to find all the interior edges and automatically suppress those. So now when I go to mesh this again, I'm going to have some nice flow throughout that part. And this is my auto mesh tool. So here I can actually change, once I auto mesh, I can change the density of edges. I can select multiple edges and set those all to a single value. And then use my mouse wheel to change that density as well as just click these arrows to change the density of those parts. I can also go in and set uh, some face controls here. So if I select these surfaces, I can force the type of element to be produced on that specific face, as well as some other mapping methods for those um, elements as well. So traditionally, the tool that we would use is the, this is the auto mesh tool. Traditionally, you'd find this in the panels. So this is another little feature. Again, if, if I were to go to that auto mesh panel and try to mesh this automatically, notice that in the bottom right corner, I have this try general 2D mesh tool. So this is a little hint telling me that, hey, there's a new tool for the operation I'm trying to run. In this case, it's automatically going to bring me to that 2D mesh ribbon. Again, this is another feature that's going to allow me to easily transition into this new interface. All right, so that's just some basics of some geometry uh, editing. Uh, I want to show you guys uh, some some splitting of a geometry with a plane. And again, this uh, split type right now, I'm just working on surfaces, but this tool is going to be the same throughout the HyperWorks interface here. So my target is going to be surfaces. I'm going to go ahead and just say Control A to select all surfaces. And I'm going to select this tool. And now Hyperworks is going to ask me to find uh, a split plane that I want to use to trim these surfaces. So in this case, I'm just going to click on this point here. And Hyperworks is going to show me a nice preview for a split plane for these surfaces. So notice that it gives me this nice tool that I can use to um, edit the plane for the split. So I can do things like move the origin of that plane around. I can drag the points of that plane to give this, you know, those three locations is going to give me a new plane. I can also do things like if I control click two locations, it's going to snap the vector of that plane. If I control click three locations, it's going to snap the plane uh, using those three uh, planar points. So again, if I want to quickly just uh, change that plane, I can align that to some two locations and I could maybe go in and drag that origin to a new location while using that plane. <clears throat> but or I can also just easily snap to different global axes as well. If that's something I care about. And after I'm done with this preview, I'm happy with this, again I can just go ahead and say split and it's going to operate that split operation. 
But that's again just some basics on surface manipulation and a little bit into 2D meshing. You know, there's a ton of new features that we can spend a lot of time on. Uh, my goal is not to be necessarily a full deep dive training, uh, but just to kind of get you guys excited about this interface. And at the end, we'll show you some resources that you guys can go to to really uh, deep dive into this stuff and uh, become an expert on our tools. All right, so now let's get into some more of the 3D geometry manipulation and meshing as well. All right, so for this model, we're going to go ahead and work on a 3D volume. So Hypeworks can create a 3D tetra mesh directly on a watertight uh, body, watertight volume. So if I were to go to the mesh ribbon, tetra mesh, and click create, if this was a watertight volume, I'd be able to select this body. But I'm clicking here, and there's it's not uh, allowing me to select this. I go to services as well, but it's just not letting me select this. So this tells me that this isn't actually a true watertight solid body. Another way I can check that is if I go through to the topology view for my surfaces, I can actually look at the topology of my geometry. So in Hyperworks, we have a few different topology types. For surfaces, we're going to see the surfaces shown in gray with their edges. And an actual full 3D watertight solid is going to be shown by a transparent green color. Uh, so some more detail here. A green edge means it's shared by two surfaces. And the red edges are telling me that those edges are not owned um, by, they're not connected. It's not connecting those surfaces. So ideally, for a watertight solid, I would have all green edges. So now I need to go in and actually edit this 3D body to create it, uh, that watertight solid. So I'm going to go ahead and head to my geometry ribbon, use the stitch tool to stitch together all of these surfaces. So first I'm going to set my tolerance to say 0.01. And what that's doing is it's any edge, any free or any edge within this tolerance is going to be uh, equivalenced. So I can select that tolerance. I can just Control A, select all those surfaces, and go ahead and stitch this body together. And I'm going to see that it's eliminated most of those free edges. I still have a couple free edges that I can see here in this model. So I can go in here and actually manually edit these edges. Just like the patch tool, I can easily click and drag that edge over to patch that surface, as well as I can go in and actually select that vertex and drag that over as well. If I'd like to, I can press shift to unpatch an edge, or sorry, unstitch uh, uh, surfaces together. I can even press shift and click the vertex to unstitch all of the surfaces that are combined at that vertex. So again, just with a couple different mouse clicks here and buttons on my keyboard, I can easily edit and manipulate my geometry. And so now we see that it looks like I have all of these green edges in my model. Uh, real quick, I'm going to go to that patch tool again and just make sure that I don't have any uh, missing geometry. So I clicked find and I see that my arrow keys have lit up, which tells me that I have an issue. So internal to my body, looks like I actually have uh, a missing surface. So I'm going to go ahead and just patch that. And again, that patch tool is really handy because sometimes those surfaces are, are hard to see or they're kind of internal to a rib or feature that makes it just hard to, to get to. So that patch tool is really going to allow us to quickly find any issues in our geometry. And now, again, I still have this 3D solid or these, uh, this, this 3D body represented by surfaces. So I could leave this if I want to, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the solids tool, turn on bounding and have this find any bounding surfaces. I'm going to go ahead and create this. And now I can see I have that nice transparent solid body, which tells me that I actually have a 3D solid in Hyperworks. All right, so once I'm there, let's go back and head back to automatic. And the automatic view is going to just set the color view to whichever tool I'm in. So right now I'm just in the basic GUI. So the default is the component that I'm looking at. But I'm going to go back to that mesh ribbon, go to Tetra mesh. And now I could actually select that component 
or that solid and produce a tetra mesh on this model. So I'm going to go ahead and use an average size of four. I'm going to click mesh. I'm going to let hyper mesh go in and mesh this part. So here I see uh, it's created a mesh. And if I want to quickly hide the geometry or elements in my model, I could click the G key, which if we notice down here on this tool, we're going to see when I click G, it's going to hide elements. If I click G again, it's going to hide surfaces. So that allows me to quickly and easily go in and isolate what I'm looking at. So I had a element size of four. And I can see that I, I kind of have a lot of these rough features around those fillets. So because I have these small fillets with that large element side, it's really uh, producing kind of a poor quality mesh on uh, this model. So a couple things I could do. Well, uh, I can go ahead. Let me just delete these elements really quick. I could go in and de-feature this model. So maybe I want to go in and find the fillets in my model. I can just grab those and say remove to remove those fillets. Uh, this tool is pretty nice as well with these uh, removing fillets. I can give a minimum and maximum value. I can also select a fillet and have it um, find uh, the fillets in the model. Let's see if I go back here. Um, I can just select this to fillets. Uh, but let's say I want to maintain those fillets in my model, but I want it to just adapt that mesh. So I'm going to head back to my mesh ribbon, that Tetra mesh tool. In this case, I'm going to turn on some uh, curvature base refinement, which is going to refine the mesh around curvature in my model. So now if I select this solid body, I can go ahead and mesh this model. And just with that default curvature base refinement, we're going to see that we have uh, some nice refinement along a lot of uh, those features where I may need to have um, better refinement in my model. All right, so that's just an example of, of how we can quickly turn on some features in uh, Hyperworks. And we could even play around with some of those uh, curvature-based uh, requirements to get even more elements depending on our features. But uh, again, I can quickly go in and edit my geometry on the fly to, to rebuild these geometries and then produce a, a nice mesh on those parts. All right, so this was Tetra meshing. Well, maybe we want to go ahead and put on a nice hex mesh on this model. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out this model, and we'll load in the next section where we'll talk about hex meshing. All right, so the next model that I'm going to load is a solid body to be solid mapped using my solid map tool. And the goal here is to produce a hex mesh on this solid body by using the solid map tool. So in Hyperx, we have a solid map tool that allows me to easily map 3D solids with hex elements. So in order for a solid body to be mapped, I need to make sure that these solid bodies are actually mappable. So I'm going to change this to a mappable view. And it's going to change the color of my uh, component based on its mappability. Right now, we're seeing this in blue, which tells me that this is a ignored solid. So oftentimes, if you bring a solid body into hyper, um, Hyperworks, it's going to be ignored at first until we do some editing. So the first thing, because I want to hex mesh this, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of some of these features, specifically the fillets on this model. So I'm going to head to the defeature tool, go to fillets. I'll set the fillet radius from 0.5 to 5 and have Hyperworks go in and find any fillet within that range. Now, I want to maintain this fillet for my analysis. So I'm just going to go ahead and shift click that fillet to remove it from my selection. And once I'm happy with everything else, I'll go ahead and say, remove all. Notice that even though those holes were found, uh, Hyperworks won't actually remove uh, full holes. But I have those fillets removed. And I've also, my model is now represented by this orange opaque color, which represents an unmappable solid. So I need to go in and edit my solid body to make sure that this is going to be mappable with the solid map tool. All right, so to do this, I'm going to head back to the split tool and use the plane split to start splitting my solid body. So my target is going to be the solid body. My tool is going to be that plane. Notice that this nice little buzz saw again gets highlighted, showing me where I'm going to split. I can go ahead and middle mouse click to split that solid body and just continue on 
to trim this body up. Notice that this is now this transparent color, which is a, known as a mappable solid in Hyperworks. All right, so I'll choose this section. I can see where it's going to split. I can continue on here to trim this solid up across this features. And finally, I'm left with this little internal body that uh, is yet to be mappable. I'm going to go ahead and transition to the split with lines tool. I'm going to click the target that I want to split. I'm just going to click I to isolate that solid body. And then I'm going to go ahead and select the lines that I want to use to trim that solid body. I'm going to make sure my extend trimmer is on and I'll go ahead and split that solid. And so now I've actually split this into three separate solids. All right. So I'll go back and press A on my keyboard to show all components. Now I can head over to my mesh ribbon, the solid map tool. And I can have Hyperworks go ahead and find any solid body that's mappable. I'm going to go ahead and change my mesh size to 2.5. And I can set some preferences for my elements. In this case, I'll use some mixed elements. So there will be some tries when needed. Uh, but I'll go ahead and say mesh. And that's going to force, uh, HyperMesh Hyper is now going to go in and, and seed all of these uh, base surfaces with a mesh uh, that's going to be mapped along those three solids. So in this tool, it's a lot like that auto mesh tool where I can actually go in and edit certain densities. And those densities are going to carry over throughout those solids. They're all going to be linked. Once I'm happy with that, I can actually go in and mesh this tool. But let's say I want to go in and edit the face of, let's say, uh, this face here. Let's turn that to quads only to force that to be quads. And I could actually go in and set these all to quads only so that I only have quads in my tool. And once I'm happy with that, I can go ahead and say mesh. And Hypeworks is going to go in and project and map all of those base surfaces across that 3D body to leave me with just uh, full hex three elements throughout that solid body. So just to recap, again, I edited my geometry to make it mappable. I visualized that using the mappable view. And then I went to the solid map tool to easily produce those base elements that are gonna be used to be mapped. So I can edit those, change the elements, just like we did when we were generating a 2D mesh. And then once I'm happy with that, I can map that along solid bodies uh, throughout that part. All right, there's kind of one extra thing that I want to show you here uh, when we're trimming a solid body. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of this model. And I'll open up kind of a smaller little solid body to edit. So we saw that I could edit that solid body using those planes. But let's say we have a solid body that has a lot of internal features. And when we split that, we only want to choose specific, specific features on that solid body. So here, if I go to the geometry ribbon and go back to that split tool and choose surfaces, I can easily go in and actually, let me go back. Sorry, use plane. Uh, I'll select my target to be that solid body. And I'm going to select uh, the plane here on that surface. So I can see that Hyperworks is finding a few different objects to split. If I were to split this, it's going to create um, a bunch of different solid bodies that I could you know, isolate to if needed. But in my case, I don't want to have all of these features split. I really only want to have um, a single uh, I only want to have a few of these features split. So I'm going to head back to that split tool. And now if I zoom into that plane again, if I see if I click on this review tool, it's going to allow me to review all those sections that Hyperworks is going to split. And here if I click shift, I can actually deselect certain features to not trim. And if I shift click and drag, I can actually go in and deselect that in all those surfaces. And now when I split this model, it's only going to split one a specific section of the tool. So again, this is just a small feature that we've added to the split tool. 
But in my eyes, it makes kind of a large difference in just the basics of editing my geometry. So again, there's tons of features like this that we can't simply cover in one webinar. Uh, but I always encourage you guys to, to follow up and look at some of the, the trainings that we have to dive into each of these features to help out with your pre-processing needs. All right, so next we're going to go ahead and take a look at uh, some more features in the HyperWorks uh, Next Generation interface. All right, so this next section, I'm actually going to head back to my slides and narrate over a uh, previously recorded session that I have. Uh, so we're going to talk about morphing, and we're actually going to compare directly HyperMesh, the classic interface, to the new HyperWorks interface in terms of morphing. So morphing allows us to update our mesh by uh, manually grabbing nodes uh, or faces of elements and moving those, or mapping those to new existing geometry. So here you see I'm going to grab the face of these elements to morph that blade up and extend that blade. So these morphed, um, th these, these morphed elements can now be saved as a shape. And that shape can be used to, again, update my geometry, or they can uh, be used for an optimization. So I can, I can actually feed these shapes into the Optistruct solver so that it can give me the optimal combination of those um, one or multiple shapes. Uh, you can see here that we're comparing the new interface versus the classic interface in both time taken uh, or time needed to execute these operations, as well as the amount of mouse clicks needed to run these operations. So I've just rotated the blade now. So now I have a shape that uh, accounts for the rotation of that blade. Again, that is saved. That can be fed into an optimization. So I can actually run an optimization that's going to give me the optimal rotation and length of this blade for a given analysis. Um, and then finally, I'm actually going to move down to this other section. We're going to update a couple things um, on that model. First, I'm going to preview those two shapes that I had created before. I'm going to use a view just to snap to that location. I'm going to edit uh, this green section of elements here. Again, you see we have to pause here just to wait for that classic interface to, to keep up um, with, the, with this next generation interface. Just a really good representation of, of how we can save time in that new interface. So I'm going to go ahead and grab some nodes. I'm going to use this cool lasso tool to grab those nodes. Select the anchors. So this is going to uh, constrain which elements and nodes won't move when I actually morph this. I can simply um, rotate those elements uh, by a certain angle. And then finally, I'm actually going to use this geometry to go in and morph this geometry to, or mo morph these elements to that new geometry. So it's pretty cool here. I'm actually going to go ahead and grab a bunch of nodes uh, similarly with that lasso effect. And I'm going to choose the target to be that surface. And we're going to see here, when we morph that mesh, it's actually going to move those nodes to that new surface. So just a comparison here. We see that we've saved about 17% of the time and also saved about 41% of the clicks needed to execute these operations. This is a really cool uh, example uh, comparing apples to apples of the classic interface to that new HyperWorks X interface. So this next topic is perhaps my favorite feature in the new interface, and that's our Design Explorer ribbon. Our Design Explorer ribbon allows us to very easily create DOEs based off of our GUI and directly on our model. So a DOE, simply put, is a minimal system of experiments that's going to give us a full picture for uh, our system. So in other words, we're trying to minimize the amount of analysis runs we need in order to discover how those affect certain outputs. So here we'll see the Design Explorer ribbon used to set up these DOEs. So first, I'm just going to go to, I'm going to create an exploration. I'm going to create a DOE. I'll call this DOE1. And next, I'm going to tell HyperWorks what variables do I want to change in this system. So in this case, I want to change the thickness of all these components. So I'm going to create gauge design variables. And I'm going to tell HyperWorks that these thicknesses can change by plus or minus 50% of their nominal value. Next, I'm going to create a shape 
variable. So again, back to those shapes, we've morphed the mesh. And now we're going to use that morph to actually uh, run, introduce into this DOE and optimization. So here I can review my variables. I can link variables together so that their values are the same. Uh, and I can preview what those values are going to look like as they go throughout that DOE. Here we see that shape change for that rail member that again is going to affect our DOE. After these design variables set, next I need to tell HyperWorks what do I care about? What are my outputs? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and create a mass response. So I'm telling HyperWorks that, hey, mass is important in this system. So let's figure out how those design variables affect mass. And let's figure out how those design variables affect the displacement at the shock tower location. So that's the goal of this DOE. How do these design variables affect my outputs that I have created? So I'll go ahead, I'm going to run a MELS DOE approach. And I'm going to submit this. What Hypeworks is doing is actually creating each of those design variable equations and submitting them to the solver. After it's ran all of those 50 runs, I can then go back in and post process these results. So I can see just a run summary. So for each run, I'm going to have given outputs. So I can actually contour those outputs, in this case, displacement directly in the GUI. I can look at uh, also the linear effects. So what is this telling me? This is telling me hey, how are my design variables affecting those outputs? And which design variables have the largest effect on my outputs? So that can allow me to filter out some unneeded variables and in turn will minimize the amount of uh, runs I need for a DOE and an optimization. I can also open up a scatter plot and plot variable inputs and outputs on the same plot uh, with some constraint values as well. And finally, what I think is the most valuable portion of this is this trade-off study. So after HyperWorks runs this DOE, it's actually going to run a regression on that DOE. And that's going to produce a very lightweight mathematical meta model that can be used to simply just drag these little sliders around in order to get a predicted output. So again, I've ran a DOE with those, with those runs. I've regressed that model. And now I have a very lightweight tool that's going to predict an output without having to run an analysis. And that mathematical meta model can be used to actually drive an optimization. So instead of the optimization needing to run an analysis each time and get those re results, it can just use that mathematical meta model as a predicting model to get those results. Uh, but I'm also going to show you guys how we can create an optimization here. So I have my design variables. I've told HyperWorks, what do I care about in my system, the mass and displacement. And now I need to go in and put some constraints and objectives on this system. So I'm going to tell HyperWorks that my objective is going to be to minimize the mass of this frame. And I want to constrain the displacement of that shock tower location. And in this case, I'm going to be using the direct solver to run this optimization. But again, keep in mind, we can use that mathematical meta model to, to have a very, very quick uh, optimization um, using that mathematical model. But here I'm just giving an upper bound on that displacement. Again, I'm going to run an optimization. So HyperWorks is going to change each of the variables on all those components, create a run model, and actually run that to your solver of choice. And after that's ran, again, we're running directly to the solver. So this run took about 1.5 hours. We can actually go in and uh, parse through that data and do some post-processing to determine which runs violated my constraints. That's going to be in red. Which runs were close to violating? That's going to be in yellow. And then which run, what is the optimal combination for my design variables that gives me the minimal amount of mass while meeting that displacement constraint? And that's going to be these results here. And again, we have all of those different variables listed out in that run. Uh, I can also go in and plot uh, s different outputs and inputs against the iteration to see per iteration what are the uh, what are each of those values set to. So that was kind of a fire hose uh, explanation of, of our Design Explorer tool. But again, this is one of my most uh, the tools that I'm most excited about because it allows us to manipulate our model right in the GUI and produce these really valuable uh, DOEs that can lead to really powerful results. So thank you guys for joining this webinar of this next generation HyperWorks interface. Uh, hopefully you guys have been asking questions in the chat. We can review those now, but uh, continue to ask questions and we'll go to those now. But thanks again for your guys' time and attention.